Okay, hello guys. Uh, today we're gonna start our chapter six, I think, which is trusses. Uh, and let's see what is this about. Trusses are one of the most common type of structures that you can find in civil engineering. Uh, this is a truss, of course. Is a truss. Those are two different type of bridges made out of trusses or three D trusses in this case. For today. We're going to be working with simple trusses and we're going to be also trying to solve those trusses and how to calculate them using the method of the joints. And maybe, and just maybe at the end, we will be discussing about what zero force members are. Applications, well, every time that you see a big storage, a big deposit, a big uh, supermarket, if you go to the roof, Usually we don't see to the roof, but if you look if you look at to the roof, you're gonna see this type of structures. You see, these type of structures made out of these elements, and those are the ones that are actually holding the whole roof of the structure. Those are some of the applications. You also saw some previous applications also, like in the bridges that I showed you before. More applications like that crane. Now in this case, you have trusses in 3D. And you have cranes and you have frames of aircrafts or a space station. And one of the one of the questions that we have to answer ourselves is how can we design a lightweight structure that will meet load safety and cost specifications? And one of the reasons or one of the ways we can do that is by using trusses. So first of all, we have to start with the definition of a truss. What is a truss? A truss is a structure composed by a slender members joined together at their, their end points. But this is not all that define a truss. You see, this is a truss, and these are the slender elements that the definition refers to. And they are connected, as you can see here, at the joints, at the end points. Now, you can have structures that look like trusses. And I always say, look like trusses, seems like trusses, taste like trusses, but they are not trusses. Because the fact that it's something that looks like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a truss. They have to, uh, we have to have several conditions for a truss actually to be a truss. And this equation that you can see here, for example, how do you build a truss? You start with a, a very basic structure made out of three elements like this and you start adding two elements and two elements and two elements. The number of joints which are these and the number of members are related by this equation. The members plus the number of reactions and the supports has to be equal to two times the number of joints. If that is happening, if that happens, then the truss is statically determined. Look at examples of trusses. Look at that bridge, that's an example of a truss another bridge, another example. In this case, well, the piers of this structure are made out of trusses, 3D trusses, of course. Something that you see most frequently are roof of houses, and yes, those are trusses also. 3D transmission towers for energy, trusses, cranes, those are trusses. Stadium roofs or retractable stadium roofs, those are trusses also. The launch pad, this is also a 3D truss. Space station, space station is a truss. Space station, look at the frame. Part of this type of uh, structures, all of those are trusses. This is a 3D truss here acting also. This is something more. Uh, common for you and when I tell you that you don't look up when you go to the places this is in the Oviedo marketplace more this is something more uh, common than the Oviedo marketplace but you have seen that and I don't know if you have realized this is the roof of the mall at Millennia you see those are 3D trusses also in that part and of course at the end everyone designs a particular type of trusses and put their name to that like this one here no, that's, that's not true. This is called a traverse bend truss. And of course you have cases like trusses gone wild. 
like happened with this one and the song there can remind you when was that this is what happened it was just exactly before the concert of Justin Timberlake in August 8 2003 look at this case here all the trusses in the roof of the houses collapsed and apparently the cause of that was mainly to the connections here with the trusses this is the Quebec Bridge it says that it was 20 years in the making and, and it collapsed immediately after it was open because no not even open the bridge collapsed during construction killing 86 workers made out of trusses this one here happened in the Loma Prieta earthquake you can see how this part of the structure collapsed also Ludendorff Bridge this is something more recent that was in 2007 and it was in Minneapolis at the end they study what happened this was captured by the DOT cameras and at the end you see how they collapse here apparently that collapse was for fatigue in the connections I another of the stages this one in Toronto Radiohead and that was in 2012 in June so but that doesn't mean that the trusses are a bad uh, mechanism it, it, the only thing that it means is that somehow uh, there were situations that escaped the control of the people that were designing those trusses now look at these trusses. Those are I, I call this uh, this uh, section trusses on asteroids because they are really big trusses. This is White River State Park, 700 foot Indiana Tower. Of course, the Eiffel Tower trusses also. This is not that big of a structure. It just happened that I I was there and I liked it. This is the Rogers Center retractable roof, in Toronto also trusses. Tokyo Sky Tree, 634 meters. Um, the name in Japanese is called Musashi, which means 634, and that's why they wanted to go up to that. But 634 meters, I want you to check the magnitude of that type of a structure. How big is that? And look at this structure. This is not an asteroid, actually, but I just brought it because. Uh, that's a 3D truss, but actually look at the size of that 3D truss. Those are called nano trusses. Um, those are using like really strong but ultra light materials and they form nano trusses and the procedure for nano trusses. You know what nano means, right? We are talking about in the order of 10 to the negative 9 meters in this particular example. So, and also you have applications like games for trusses, like I'm not making any advertising for any game in particular, but this Cargo Bridge game is a nice game. Uh, you really get hooked with that game. And once you use that game, I'm not going to play it, okay? And I don't even know what is I have here in, in advertising, but when you start the game, uh, it's really nice because you start and you select the level that you are at and it start really easy what you have to do is build a bridge truss from here to here and in order to do that you have certain amount of money and certain type of materials these are the wood connectors and these are the woodwork this is a nice example because you start with these let's say um, and you do a really nice small truss here And once you have it, you test it. You test it here. And now this person has to go capture the box and take it to the other side. And then you want this amount of money here. And then you go to the next level. And every single level is 
getting a little bit more complicated. In this case, you have to bridge two of those. And remember, you have the same amount the same amount of money and the same type of connector. So you start and you design another another bridge here, another truss here. I don't know if this is going to be sufficient. From here to here. From here to here. I don't know, whatever way you consider. And I can guarantee you that you're going to have a lot of collapses here. Uh, this is asymmetric, you see. Uh, but I don't care too much. And then you put this here because it's whatever you're going to walk on top of that. And then you have the first one and then you build the second one also similar from these two. You build the second one here. And as you are going forward, the amount of money, of course, is becoming smaller and then and smaller your bank account is getting reduced and then you have there and you don't have anything else and you say oops what happened here I don't know look at that thing how frail it is in that part so look why because I didn't put the boards here so that helps you out at least to realize the dimensions and how uh, the structure behaves and in the third level you start I don't know you like these games right so you start pushing elephants and things like that and the most important part is that it gives you a, a very good idea of the triangularity of the trusses which is one of the things that you have to take into account all the time analysis of the sign assumptions so when designing the member of a trust we have to verify some conditions the first one is that they, they say that all the loads are applied at the joints and only at the joints. And the self weight of the truss is often neglected, which is not true, but at least it's not considered self distributed. The self weight of the truss is also placed on the joints. Um, but how do you do that? Because usually what you have is this you have a part, cap of, couple of columns here and a truss, and then you re replicate this in the other side also. And then you put the roof on top of that. Usually what is the, 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 the highest load that this type of construction can have, or one of the most important ones at least, is the wind. So whenever you have the wind, the wind is blowing here in this part. But when that happens, don't tell me that this force with the pressure of the wind distributed over this plank is transmitted to the joints. Actually, it's transmitted everywhere along the truss. So then we are not complying with one of the conditions for the truss. How do you do that? If we, if we put the force here, then you're going to have deflections. And we don't want deflections. Why? Because the members are really slender. That's why you don't, we don't want those deflections to be. So how do you do that? How do you ensure that? Well, instead of putting the plank on top of the truss, you put these little small beams called purlins between this joint and this joint. And then you put the plank on top of that. In that way, whenever you have a load on top of this plank, that load is going to be transmitted to this point and to this point, as you can see here. First condition, don't match. Second condition, the members are joined together by a smooth pins. And this assumption is satisfied in more practical cases where the joints are formed by bolting or welding. How are you going to tell me that if you bought or weld something, that's going to be a smooth pin? Let's see some examples. Does this look to you like a smooth pin? Or this? Or even this? Well, this could be not smooth, but let's say a rusted maybe pin. But yes, how are these going to be pins? Or even these? Look at that. Well, the reality is that even though those structures are not perfect pins, they cannot resist too much moment because of the slenderness of the element and everything is going to rotate. Then why do we do it like that? Because it's a lot cheaper to build this than to create a perfect pin here. And this kind of behave within our assumptions like a smooth pin. So we have the second one. If we comply with this and this, 
Then what we have basically is a two force member, and in two force members, all the forces, like these ones, are gonna be subject either to compression, like this case, or to tension, like this case. And that's really important because if you have those elements are slender, so you have that element that is a slender, if you bend it, it's gonna bend really easy. But if you just apply tension or compression to that element, it's gonna be able to resist it fairly, fairly good. So there are different methods for solving trusses. One of the methods, as I told you, is called the method of the joint. The method of the joint consists in going, doing a free uh, body diagram of the truss, where you have here the reactions, this is a pin and this is a roller, and then you start isolating joint by joint and putting all the forces that are applied to that joint. For example, the joint B, this is an example of joint B. In joint B you have one force, tension or compression, in this case it's a tension but you don't know for sure until you do it. You have a force here and a force here, which are these two, those are the internal forces in the bars, and then you have this external force applied here. What we are doing basically when we work with uh, trusses and 2D trusses is that we are dealing with a particle equilibrium. And as you know, or you should know by now, when you do particle equilibrium, you, this, you have two equations that you can use. Those equations are summation of forces in X and summation of forces in Y. Those are the two main equations that you have. That means that by solving a truss by the method of the joints, I can have up to a maximum of two unknowns in that joint. One unknown, two unknown. How do I do that? Summation of forces in X equals zero, summation of forces in Y equals zero, and I can solve for that problem. So a step for the analysis, if the support reactions are not given and they are needed in the calculation, and what do I mean when they are needed? I'm gonna show you later in the, in the example. Then you can calculate them. But how do you calculate them? By doing external summation of forces and external summation of moments like we did in equilibrium or 3D bodies. Now you draw a free body diagram of the joints with a maximum of two unknowns. And you start doing summation of forces in X and Y like equilibrium in that joint. And you solve it. Let's do this example. And I'm gonna switch to a camera document because it's gonna be not I'm going to say easier, but you're going to follow it better if I use camera document here. So let's say that you have uh, this truss, and in this truss, basically, we have a force of 200 pounds here, and we have a force of 5 hundred pounds acting in this direction and also uh, this is four this height here is four feet and three feet and four feet here and this is a pin support it's a pin support and this is a roller this end and uh, we have to find find this is what we are asked to do find forces in each member okay First thing that we have to do is, or first thing that we want to do maybe, is do the free body diagram of this structure. And if you start, you can put here your reactions. This is a pin support. If it's a pin support, means that I'm gonna have one force here. If I call this A, B, and C, this here is gonna be a Y, and then I'm gonna have a force here, which is gonna be AX, 
and this is the roller so it's going to have only one reaction perpendicular to the surface of the roller and this is CY. Now uh, I can actually start solving this problem without calculating the reactions. I can calculate the reactions if I want to. Uh, I, it's not that I need them but let's do it and I'm going to tell you why I can do it without the reactions later. Let's do summation of moments at A equals zero and I'm going to uh, say this is the positive moment for my convention. So if I do summation of moments here at this point, let's start with this force here. This is going to be in this direction, CY times 7. And, you know, it's coming in this direction. That's why I put it positive. And this force here is going to be 200. Force is vertical. The distance has to be horizontal times 3. And if this is pin here and I apply the force like this, the rotation is going to happen in this direction and that direction is opposite to this one so it's going to be negative and same with this one this one if I pull it in this direction it's going to rotate also uh, clockwise and I say counterclockwise is positive so this is going to be negative 500 times the height which is 4 and that's equal to 0 from here we can calculate CY from that uh, equation I don't know if I have the values here for CY, but it doesn't matter if I have them or I don't. I don't even have a calculator with me now. Yeah, well, anyway, you can calculate CY, okay, from this equation. The only thing they're going to have, this is 200 times 3 is 600, 600, 2000, so negative 2600 pass it to the other side, 2600 divided by 7, and 2600 divided by 7 is, let me use the calculator from the computer, 2600 divided by 7. So it's 371.43, 371.43. Three. And the units for these have to be pounds because everything is in pounds here. Okay? Now, uh, now we have CY. Now let's go to the other reaction, and the other reaction that we have is uh, here. Is AY. Can I calculate AY? Yes, I can calculate AY because I can do summation of forces in Y equals zero, and then I have AY minus 200, this one, plus CY, that is this value, has to be equal to zero. And when I calculate this, it's going to tell me that AY is going to be, when I pass it to the other side, negative 171.43 pounds. Remember, that negative, what means actually is AY, instead of being in this direction, the correct direction for AY is going to be opposite to whatever I assumed before. So that means that AY is going to be 171.43, but the joint A, which is this one, and the force is going to be acting in this direction, and this is pounds. And I could have done from the beginning summation of forces in x equals zero. And if I do summation of forces in x equals zero from the beginning, what I'm going to get here is what? Ax plus 500 equals zero, so Ax equal negative 500, same, same situation, that means that Ax actually has to come in this direction, and is 500 pounds. I, what I do is I immediately change the sign here, so I don't get confused later, and I put this as the correct side, a direction for that one. I say, okay, I calculated this, but what if I tell you that right now that I don't need to calculate that? Then what, what, what did we do it? Well, we did it because I want to show you all the time. I'm not going to say that you waste it, but if it's a test, definitely, yes, you waste that time. Because if you remember, we say we can start isolating joints with two or less unknowns. If I didn't calculate this, any of these, and I go to this joint, I have one unknown, two unknown, three, four, so I couldn't do that. If I come to this one, I have one, two, and three unknowns. But if I came directly to this joint, which is what we're going to do now, I only have one unknown and one unknown here. So this is the other way that we can 
have started the problem and the way that I actually I will start the problem I'm gonna start a join B which is this one and you're gonna put all the forces that that join has on top of it I have this force and this force is 200 pounds this force which is 500 pounds and then I have this bar and this bar and I'm gonna put both of them pointing downward I know that's not gonna be true but right now you don't have the sufficient uh, maturity let's say because it's the first problem that we are doing so you still don't don't know exactly how to identify those bars so for the time being let's put the bars like that and they say this is the force AB AB the force AB and this one here is going to be the force BC um, I know this angle here how do I know that? well because if this is 4 and this is 4 and I take inverse tangent of 4 divided by 4 this angle is going to be 45 degrees and in the other case I know also that this is 3 and this is 4 so this distance has to be 5 so I can do this is 3 this is 4 and this is 5 here 3 4 5 and I can use that for calculating now what do we do here well I have one unknown two unknowns then I can do summation of forces in X let's say summation of forces in X equals 0 if I do that what do I have in X first thing that I have is this 500 pounds force which is positive because I'm assuming that this is the positive direction for X now this this one here also the horizontal component of this is going to be positive and it's going to be BC cosine 45 degrees if I say this angle here is 45 degrees and this one here remember this triangle 3, 4, 5 so this is going to be the horizontal is going to be negative 3 fifth AB and that has to be equal 0 how many unknowns do I have in this equation 1 and 2 I still can't solve it like that but if I do now summation of forces in Y equals 0 and I say my positive is pointing up then I can start at this joint and I can say okay this value here is negative 200 and then I have negative BC if I say this is the angle this is going to be sine 45 negative AB times 4 fifth equals 0 and now you solve the system how do you solve the system It's up to you uh, but by solving the system by solving the system then you can calculate and then you have the VA is gonna be 214 pounds um, BC is gonna be negative 525.3 pounds that negative means that actually this force BC wasn't coming in this direction but the right direction the correct direction for that force is entering into the joint and I had it exiting or leaving the joint why is that important I'm gonna show you that immediately so this force BC actually BC is 525.3 pounds but it's gonna be entering in the joint B like that I'm gonna show you what that means now how do you solve this system? I say it's up to you, right? But if, if you are smart and you are you have done this type of thing before, before you know that cosine and sine of 45 are the same thing, so I can add together and this and this cancel out. I add these two, so I have 300, and then I have eight feet, uh, seven fifth AB equals zero, and I solve that just by canceling this out. 
another. Now, what does that mean? That part that uh, entering or leaving the join. That's what is gonna define if the join, if the element is in tension or is in compression. So let's assume that you have a bar connected here, which could be the bar that we were doing now, the BC. So this will be the joint B, and this will be the joint C. And I just make a cut here, because I was isolating this joint. So, and I, we determined that the force BC was entering in that joint like that. Well, if that force enters in that joint, now let's study the bar, because I have a bar here also, remember? This is the joint B, but what about the bar? If the force goes here at the joint, and the bar has to come like that. Because these two has to be in equilibrium. And in this other end of the bar, if, if it, this force is entering in the bar like that, it has to come in the bar like that also, because it has to be opposite to this to be in equilibrium. Remember the two force member? And at the joint C then, if this force is like that, at the joint C it has to be like that. Now, this force was entering in the joint, right? Look what it's producing to the bar. That bar is how? In tension or compression? Yes, it's in compression. And if you have the other situation, let's say that you have a completely unrelated problem, and this is not joint B and C, let's say this is K and L joint, and let's assume that when I calculated, I, I found that the force in the joint K was in this direction. Well, if the joint in, in this direction is there, that means that in the, in the other, ex end of the bar, the force has to come in this direction, and the other end, the force has to come in this direction, and in the other joint here, has to come in this direction. And look at what is happening in this bar, this is tension. You know, you don't have to do this analysis every time that you, you are solving a problem, but what is important to get from here is, whenever you have a force entering in one joint, it's also going to be entering in the other joint connected to it. And the bar is going to be subject to compression. And whenever you have a force leaving a joint, it's going to be also leaving the other joint. And the bar is going to be subject to tension. That's the most important thing that you have to take from this discussion. Now, going back to this problem that we had here, this force, AB, is leaving the joint. If it's leaving the joint, if it's leaving the joint like that, exiting the joint, the bar is subject to tension. Then I'm going to put here tension. And the force B was entering in the joint. And as we discussed here, Whenever you have a force entering in that joint, the bar is going to be subject to compression. So this is going to be the compression in that part. Okay, now we calculated this one and this one. Let's assume that we didn't do this. Then I could move either to this one or to this one. Let's say if I move to this one, I wouldn't know still this or this, so two unknowns and three unknowns. I couldn't do this, but I can come to this one. How? Because if I come to this one, my only two unknowns will be this and this. In reality, I know this because I calculated, but I'm, I'm saying, just imagine that we didn't calculate it before. Okay, let's go to the joint C. If I go to joint C, My joint C is this. I have my reaction CY, which I know I'm, I'm not going to copy it, but I'm going to assume that I don't know it yet. CY. And then I have this force, which is BC. Now, 
This is really important. Pay attention to this one. BC. Then I come to the drawing that I did before and I say, look at BC. BC is entering to the joint B. That means that that force BC must be also entering at the other joint connected to that bar, which is the joint C. And that's what we're going to do. So that force BC, I know the value, I just calculated, and it's 525.3 pounds. And I still don't know uh, what is the direction of this, but I can know it because I don't care. Because remember, every time that I do the summation of forces, if the value is negative, that means that it's opposite to the direction. But it's better if I kind of have a better approximation. Uh, look at this. If I do in my mind summation of forces in x equals 0, that would mean that the horizontal component of this goes to the right, and the only one that can oppose it is this, so this has to go to the left, just by doing that. What is this value? This value is, uh, this force is the force AC, and this angle here we calculated before, and it was 45 degree angle. So then if I want to calculate AC, AC, I can say that negative AC by doing summation of forces in x equals 0, negative AC plus BC cosine 45 degrees has to be 0, and BC, remember, I know the value, and from here I can solve for AC, and AC is 371 pounds, and it's positive, positive if I put it going out of the joint, that means that it's stay going out of the joint, and that means that that force is going to be in tension. You see, we solved the problem, and I didn't even need to calculate this. Now, if you want to be sure that what you did is correct, then you can say that summation of forces uh, in Y equals zero, and you can recalculate CY that we did before for this method, recalculate it by saying that negative, or CY minus BC sine 45 degrees equals zero, and when you do that, I'm going to use the calculator again here. we get that CY is 371.43, which is probably this value also here, the same value, yeah, 0.43. This is just rounded up pounds. So you see this value and this value are the same. That means that I just corroborated the same calculation in two different ways. At the end, the problem wasn't asking us for this value or for this value. The only thing that we wanted to calculate is these three bars, the forces in those three bars. And we built like a small table with all the results. And the table should look something like that. Here, the value of the force, like VA, the, the name of the force, the value, and if it's tension or compression. This is the first force that we calculated, 200, or one of the first, 214 tension. The other one is 525.3 compression, and that force is BC, 525.3, and that's going to be compression. And then the force CA is 371, probably 371.4, and that was in tension. This is the way you have to solve these type of problems. What is the complication? A larger amount of joints and a larger amount of members. On top of that, everything is going to be basically the same thing. Uh, now, what do you do with these values? This is not the statics, okay? But it's just for you to have an idea of what you are, what you do with that. Once you have these forces, 
and if they are only tension or compression, let's say that you want to make this, uh, the truss made out of steel. There's something that is called stress, and you're gonna learn that stress on the steel, let's say, and uh, it's kind of a pressure when it's actual or uh, stress. So it's gonna be the force divided by the area. This value, it depends on the type of material. This is a value that is obtained in the lab, and but it's more or less constant for the same type of material. It could be 50 KSI, for example, 65 KSI, 35 KSI, depending what type of steel we're using, but you know this value. And we just calculated this one. So we solve for area. In that way, I can calculate the area of each one of the bars of this truss. These P are these values, and these depends on the material that I'm using. And what is the area? The cross-sectional area of those bars. What do we do now? Well, depends. You can make, you can build them if you want to, or if you are making out of steel or aluminum. Then you go to the manuals, and in the manuals you're gonna have different type of sections, different type of sections. I'm not gonna draw all of them, just so, so few of them, okay? But you're gonna have different type of these type of sections with different areas that they are commercially available. You just select them and then optimize your design. That's basically the way uh, you analyze and design a really small truss like, like this one. Okay, uh, I think that's sufficient for today. Next class, we're gonna start working with zero force members, zero force members in the trusses. And I'm gonna show you there are members, there are elements in the trusses that actually, uh, they are not transmitting or receiving any force in the truss. And one of the questions is always why they are there, what well, those members exist then? Well, that is a question that I want you to start thinking of. And next class, we will be discussing and abounding on that. See you next class, guys, and have a nice day.